So we will start with the very basics as I see this, and uh, this is understanding variables. So although I believe that a lot of you may already be aware of what are the different types of variables, in the first 15 minutes of this session, we will do exactly and just that. We will talk about the different types of variables. So the different types of variables are classified into two broad categories. One is the quantitative and the other is the qualitative variables, as you might already be aware of. So beyond this, the qualitative variables are either the quantitative variables, they could be either continuous or let me also engage my pen at this time so that I can annotate my videos. And so these uh, quantitative variables, as you are aware, could be continuous or discrete variables. Continuous variables and discrete variables, simple English terms, I'm not going to explain them. Continuous variables, as you know, could be height, weight, or variables like age. Discrete variables, these could be numbers. This could be number of children, number of rooms, and as you are familiar, parity, gravida, all these are discrete numbers that may arise in data. On the other hand, the qualitative variables, again, these are of two types. These could be nominal or categorical. That means just a category without any relation between categories. And if you have your chat box active, Let's, let's see if any one of you could tell me what are the different types of uh, categorical or nominal variables before I proceed further from here. There could be hobbies, there could be race, there could be colors, male, yes, Z uh, Zainaba, Ananya, thank you. Thank you for participating actively in this small exercise. Yes, the other kind of qualitative variables are ordinal. These could be those variables or those categories which have an inherent order between them. For example, there could be in the earnings, you could divide the groups into low, medium, and high. There could be low earning group, medium earning group, or high earning group. And similarly, you could make categories of any uh, quantitative variable so that there could be a definitive order which is indicated but there is no numerical involved in this. So if this is clear, uh, the rest of the presentation will revolve around these names, discrete, continuous, ordinal, and nominal. In case there is any, any confusion at this point of time regarding this, please feel free to put this in the chat box while I proceed forward. I will be happy to come back to this concept at another time again. So again, types of variables. People often get confused in the different names that are given to every variable. So sometimes it is referred to as an outcome variable. It could be a dependent variable, a response variable, a predicted variable, an explained variable. Some papers might call it a regression. But these are all just this name for a single outcome variable. If you are trying to determine the outcome of the patient after six days of labor, then your outcome variable would be called the dependent variable, the response variable, the predicted variable, explained variable, whatever. So please do not get confused by the different names that statisticians love to use for just describing the outcome variable. Similarly, there are predictor variables. You might want to see that the outcome of labor was uh, dependent upon the age or the sex of the individual. All these become the predictor variables. And they are also known by different names. And it is common practice for statisticians to confuse us clinicians by using these names. And these could be independent variable, exposure variable, risk factor, covariate, explanatory variable, regressor. So next time when you hear these terms, please don't get confused because they are just the same name for
for any risk factor that you are studying in your study. Again, I believe that this is clear and we proceed forward from here. And there is another classification that we use for types of variables. A variable could also be called a confounder. It could be called a mediator and it could be called an effect measure modifier. So the previous two slides told you about the different types of variables, whether numerical, categorical, quantitative, qualitative. The other slide talked to you about outcome and predictor variables. And this slide probably introduces some names that might be new to you. So let's see what is a confounder, what is a mediator, and what is an effect measure modifier. Let's begin with the confounder and let's try and see that we are trying to figure out what is the association between X and Y. So Y becomes the outcome variable, X becomes the risk factor or the predictor variable. So our question of interest or our research focuses around trying to ascertain and determine what is the association or is there an association between X and Y? But we may not have taken care of a variable which was C, which was impacting both X and Y. And if there is such a variable which is impacting by its presence, both the outcome variable and the predictor variable, then this becomes what we know as the confounder. Let's see, there may be another variable which comes as a mediator. Now this variable lies in the pathway of the progress from X to Y and X cannot go to Y without the mediation of M. And this M is a mediator. That means the X cannot reach Y or Y cannot happen in the association and it happens through the mediating process of a mediator. A third kind is the effect measure modifier. Now to understand what is effect measure modifier, I will take you back to probably the time when you were in class 11 or class 12 or class 10 or nine when you learned chemistry. And in chemistry, you realize that there was something called an enzyme. So if you remember what is an enzyme, an enzyme is a substance which is present in the medium and which accelerates the reaction from X to Y. If this enzyme is present, it accelerates the reaction. If enzyme is not present, it, the reaction may happen, but it happens more slowly. So I will try and uh, uh, give you this simile. And this is how it works that the enzyme or the if enzyme is the effect measure modifier and it changes the effect of X and Y, the association of X and Y by its mere presence. If the effect measure modifier is present in a small quantity, then the X to Y proceeds at a different rate. Whereas if it's present in a larger quantity, then the X to Y association becomes stronger and the effect is changed. So that means it modifies the effect of association between X and Y. That's an effect measure modifier. So recapitulating, we did three terms in this slide. These were confounder, mediator, and effect measure modifier. So, so much so for variables, but most of us in all our research are trying to address what is confounding. That means a hidden variable that we have not addressed, that we have not realized exists and changes the association between X and Y. There are different approaches to handle confounding. There is a literature-based approach and there is a data-based approach. So scientists will always study literature and try to assess what are the best ways to address confounding on the literature-based approach. But sometimes when we have not taken enough care, we might have to finally 
address this at the data stage. So confounding can be controlled at the design stage when you're designing the study and the methods to do that are called restriction, matching and randomization. We'll talk a little bit more about these. And then if you have failed to address them at the design stage, then you can do it at the analysis stage. And at the analysis stage, we have several methods to do this as standardization, stratification, regression techniques, and some more. I won't confuse you by naming them, but what is restriction? When you're designing a study, you would like to restrict or limit the inclusion of individuals who are similar in terms of their confounders. You would want to take only one kind of uh, people in your study. If you want to see the effect of, uh, let's say, uh, the parity on uh, the labor, and you feel that there might be a variable which changes uh, both the parity as well as the labor, then you would like to take only those people who are similar with respect to that factor. Or you could do matching. In that way, you would be selecting cases that may have the same value of the variable that may ultimately prove to be a confounder. But you can do both these methods only if you have addressed and you have recognized the possibility that a factor may be a confounder. In randomization, uses the play of chance. You don't know which patient will get what, and you just use the beauty of chance to do the matching and randomization for you and put the people into equal groups and taking care of all the confounding factors and distributing them equally in both the groups. So that's randomization. So not, not great rocket science, but just uh, a play on words. At the design stage, you can address confounding. And if you've forgotten to address at the design stage, there are still ways and means to address it at the analysis stage. Let's talk about developing a directed acyclic graph. Now, this is the last slide before we break, uh, take a break and I ask you to share any questions or thoughts. So please prepare your questions and start pouring them into the chat box here. Before I introduce the concept of directed acyclic graph. So when you are designing your dissertations or your research or your work, it is always good to think of various risk factors that could change the association between X and Y. For an example, let's see that if you were trying to address and trying to figure out what is the association between the time spent on screen by a child and childhood obesity, you might want to see what is the association of how much time he spends on the screen and how he develops obesity. Now, these are our variables of interest. You might realize that the education level of parents is a factor which could influence screen time and could also influence directly the obesity presence of the child. So this becomes a confounder. You might also realize that increased screen time leads to reduced physical activity, which in turn leads to obesity. So if you have been following me closely, now physical activity comes in the pathway from screen time to obesity, and thus it becomes a mediator in this relationship. Parental education was a confounder. Obesity becomes a mediator. Now you might realize that both screen time and obesity might lead and cause self-harm to an individual. 